put your cursor to the bottom of the box underneath your video. I already, already got it. It says it's recording to the iCloud. There we go. All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Frame. I'm your medical director, lead medical director for FERCOM. And I want to welcome you to this uh, medical director roundtable. Most of the time we talk about medical things as it relates to patient care and such. Today, we're going to cover a mandatory topic according to the National Registry of of uh, EMT's paramedics, National Registry mandates that we talk a little bit about immunizations. And not only immunizations from the standpoint of what EMS personnel should have, but I'm gonna give you a little bit more of a broad general background of what immunization should look like, philosophy behind them, the different types of uh, vaccinations and such, and why they're needed to protect ourselves out in the field, both as EMS as well as a general US population, and again, as a world population. So uh, first thing I need to hear from everybody is if everybody can hear me okay and you can see me okay. If so, just type in yes or no, and I'll be able to see your responses. Okay. All right, very good. Okay. Uh, what we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about some of the things that are out there as far as immunizations are concerned and what we want to do as a EMS providers. Now, in Texas, especially in other places in the country, fully certified licensed paramedics are considered healthcare providers. And under the direction of it, a, a, a physician, more likely than not an emergency uh, medicine physician, you'll be able to practice the so-called eyes and ears of that physician. And under proper medical direction with proper oversight and such, you'll be able to administer care to patients. Although we typically think of paramedics as the Squad 51 from the 1972 series emergency, just dealing with fire department, emergency medicine type issues on the street, uh, illnesses and injuries. We now see the paramedic extending out into several areas, one of them being a critical care paramedic Second is now being a hospital paramedic where paramedics are actually doing things in the emergency department as part of the nursing team, starting IVs, giving medication, signing out drugs, doing charting, and doing overall patient assessments. And then third, we see critical care paramedics. In other words, those type of paramedics that do field and air transport. So these would be paramedics that care patients through a mobile care unit, ambulance, or weather permitting <coughs> hospital uh, or private air ambulance service based helicopters that move patients back and forth. Of course, there's a registered nurse and a critical care paramedic with them as well. And then we see the paramedic expanding their role into community paramedic where they actually are part of a fire department or an EMS agency that goes out and visits patients two weeks after their discharge from the hospital four weeks before somebody's just calling up for general welfare checks where you don't really actually need a 911 response. <clears throat> Paramedics are also now taking larger roles as far as rural health are concerned and through the modality of what they call telemedicine. So if you're out in a rural area and you're in contact with me through iPad and we're discussing stuff, um, you may have certain things available to you that we could administer to a patient. In a very small subset of patients, we're gonna be talking about vaccinations. So a couple of statistics that are pretty sobering uh, when we talk about vaccinations is what effect will it have on the American populace? How does that become an advantage for the patient? And how does that become an advantage for the EMS person? First thing I wanna talk about is pneumonia. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the country and over um, 56 to 60,000 people a year die from pneumonia depending on whether or not there's an influenza epidemic attached to it or not. And so we see um, over 1.1 million hospitalizations per year for pneumonia. Keep in mind, pneumonia is year round. Pneumonia can strike at any time. Bacterial pneumonias and the sepsises that they cause and such are pretty virulent, if you would, especially to the older population, those that are sedentary in their lives, those that are morbidly obese, People who don't get around and do much, more susceptible to pneumonias. So are COPDers, chronic bronchitis, and asthmatics. They 
more susceptible to malignancy. And of course, anybody who's immunocompromised, organ transplant patients being one, patients with cancers and such being another, and those with chronic autoimmune illnesses can certainly uh, have a diminished immune response to any challenge that they have. So when they inhale a bacteria, when they ingest a bacteria, however it gets into the body, uh, anybody who does not have a competent immune system will certainly be subjected to the virulence of that bacteria. Unfortunately, the most virulent bacteria, there's about six strains of them uh, that cause pneumonia. Many of them are what they call pneumococcal uh, subtypes. And pneumococcal vaccine, or the uh, pneumococcal bacteria is particularly virulent and has a high morbidity and mortality because even in the competent immune system, the bacteria have evolved to provide themselves a defense mechanism. In this particular case, if you're a Star Trek or a Star Wars fan, when the ships are under attack, they go shields up. Pneumococcal vaccines are just that. They have a very slimy, sugar, polysaccharide capsule that surrounds the bacteria. So when the white blood cell comes up to engulf it, it just keeps slipping away, shields up. And so with a replication rate of about every four hours that the pneumococcal bacteria split in half and double in size, you can imagine that if it even fends off the immune system for 12 hours, that's three doubling times and you got yourself pretty much 16 times the bacteria that you had than when you first started. And subsequently, a, a person who's immunocompromised could be uh, at risk. And it's probably the reason why we get 60,000 deaths a year from pneumonia, uh, one of the big reasons. In any event, we do have a vaccine for that, believe it or not. So if you're called to the healthcare paramedic kind of role where we're passing out pneumococcal vaccines or giving them to you, uh, the first thing you want to do is <clears throat> is uh, check your at-risk populations. Usually people over the age of 50 or under the age of six months <clears throat> are at risk for any type of immune disease processes and such. Uh, those, again, with cancers or immunocompromised can certainly uh, be at risk as well in COPD, asthmatics, chronic bronchitis. So they need a pneumococcal vaccine. That's given once every five years. It uh, elicits a very strong immune response, but it's very protective. It's almost 95% effective in preventing pneumococcal pneumonias, which are the deadliest form of the pneumonias that we deal with. So when we take a look at those vaccines, and as you draw it up and you say, okay, I'm gonna give you two mLs of a pneumococcal vaccine here, uh, you're gonna be given it uh, according to uh, protocol. And that protocol will list not only the type of patient you should be considering for it, but where to give the vaccine, how to date and time the vaccine and such, and then looking for any adverse or allergic effects. But when a person asks you as a paramedic, as a healthcare provider, no longer just a paramedic, but a healthcare provider, how does the pneumococcal vaccine help me? You can now explain to them that all six serotypes are in the vaccine. And what it does is it challenges the immune system. And we use what they call an attenuated vaccine. In other words, the bacteria exist, their polysaccharide coating exists, but they've chemically and genetically modified it so that the nucleus is pretty much gone. The nucleus is what's going to dictate what the bacteria does when it's inside the body. By taking the brains out and taking its ability to reproduce out, all you've got is this bacteria floating around with this polysaccharide covering, and the body is able to come up to it attack it, process it, and form very specific antibodies against it so that when the real deal bacteria comes through and tries to invade the body, the immune system can attack it within the first six hours and have a complete response within 24 hours and actually destroy the bacterium before it even gets to start to replicate it. So that's the, the big overview, if you will, of how vaccinations work and why they work the way they do. So as we move on off the pneumococcal vaccine, we get into the next real major one, the influenza. Now there's three types of influenza. There's an A, a B, and a C. They don't even test for C. It's a little bit worse than the common cold, but it's not as bad as the real influenza viruses. And so influenza A, the uh, so-called Spanish flu in 1918 that killed 
many, many people, more people than the battlefields of World War I killed, uh, both in Europe as well as Baltimore. Uh, then you had the avian flus, the Hong Kong flus, and then finally the, uh, uh, the most recent ones. Uh, these are all uh, uh, virulent types of influenza that have two components to them. They have a hemagglutinin and a neuramidase, an H and an N. So when they talk about H1N1, H2N2, it really talks about the serotype, in other words, what type it is. So an H3N2 may be an avian or, or one of the other types, an H1N1, of course, would be the big one. Uh, the Spanish flu, if you will, the H5N1, which uh, was responsible for a lot of deaths here just recently. Uh, these are all uh, subtypes of the the normal um, uh, influenza that floats around the world at any given year. Now, if you've noticed the last couple of years, we haven't had much of an influenza epidemic. It wasn't uh, 2009, 2010 when we had the big H5N1 that floated through and, and killed a lot of people, including those in Texas here, who was responsible for 95 uh, deaths in children alone throughout the country, but uh, well over 50,000 adults uh, were, were killed by the influenza virus. So it's not a benign disease by any stretch of the imagination. One of the problems with the influenza is that it has a broad spectrum of uh, disease, if you would, associated with it. So you can have a variability of symptoms from very mild cough, cold, congestion, low grade fever, muscle aches, all the way through the big headaches with the shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, and the sepsis looking condition. Unfortunately, it's a virus. We don't have too much that we can throw against the virus from an IV standpoint that will save these folks like we do for bacteria. Got to have 50 antibiotics out there. No, we only got one or two for, for influenza. And even then, those are 66% effective, if you would. So far, again, we talk about the type of vaccines each year that we give to military personnel and EMS personnel. Now, each year you're required to get an influenza vaccine. That means that it's taken all the viruses from the year before, plus the real badass ones, like the H1N1, and the Victoria, which is the uh, B virus, the influenza B virus, plus whatever viruses float around last year, we make the vaccine against that. We don't know what's coming up this year, you never know what's gonna come up the year ahead of you. So what you do is you put a vaccine in place that was from the year before, plus a couple of the baddies from, like I said, the H5N1 and the H1N1, uh, which killed a lot of people in the country. You put that into the vaccine as well. And so there's usually four for EMS and healthcare workers and military personnel. And there's three viruses for the general populace, if you will. And so you take last year's virus and throw it in there as well to make it four. And you hope that the cross sensitivity, the cross immunogenicity of the viruses, if it killed the H5N1 and this year came out H3N2, well, it's not going to be a very good match. So maybe about 30% of the people will be protected and the other 70% are going to get H3N2. But if you get an H5N1 this year, an H5N2 or an H5N4 the year after, you got something that's what they call an antigenetic drift. And subsequently, your protection is going to be almost 90%. I don't think that there's an influenza vaccine out there that will protect against 100% of it. But if you can at least lessen the symptoms and lessen the number of occurrences, then you can prevent epidemics in that manner. Again, for those of you who are very inquisitive, jump into your textbooks and look up Spanish flu, what it did to Europe and Baltimore in 1918. And you'll see that the invention of vaccinations, which occurred in 19, well, all the way through the 20th century when it started with yellow fever and smallpox and some of the other uh, vaccinations that were formalized at that time, you'll see how many lives it has actually saved. So for this year, uh, we're looking at uh, the CDC is predicting a sporadic year, in other words, a non-epidemic year. Now, that could change at any time. All of a sudden, a cohort of people, let's say 1,000 people show up in the emergency rooms in Dallas over a period of a month, and they all got the same influenza. Well, then it just popped up from somewhere, and you, you never know where it's come from. Viruses have a mind of their own. 
So bottom line is you have to ask yourself, how does influenza spread? How does pneumococcal pneumonia spread? Well, they're pneumonias and just by the fact of their name and where they infect the lungs, you can imagine that coughing and sneezing or exchange of body fluids from the respiratory tract is the best way to spread these. And so when you as EMS personnel know that you're going into a patient's home that has or is suspected to have pneumonia or influenza, then in addition to your PPE is gonna be a, maybe a mask. And it'll probably even be mandatory. When we get real big outbreaks and such, your EMS medical directors will mandate, in addition to gloves, that you also put on masks as well. When you get into some of the more serious, uh, I'm sorry, the more deadly viruses, such as hot loss or any of the um, Ebola viruses and such like that, you'll, uh, you'll find that <clears throat> West Nile virus is another one. You'll find that counts would probably need to be indicated as well. You guys remember the Ebola from uh, a couple of years ago hit the Dallas area here, just two or three patients, but it was enough uh, to, to cause a, a nationwide uh, response, if you would. Uh, in my meager criticism of that, it turned into be a five alarm panic. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was one person with the documented disease who spread it to two nurses very, very easily. Um, when caught early, the Ebola, even the uh, Zaire version, which is almost 100% fatal, if it's caught early, it can be treated, and the, and the two nurses survive. And of course, the gentleman that had it, that brought it in from the country, that lied about it, and came into the country, um, he, he, of course, died from it. So Ebola is a different animal altogether, and, and I'm not aware that there's any vaccines against it right now, at least uh, uh, from what I can see that sit the general populace. Now, as far as uh, your PPE protection is concerned, every time there's an endemic in the area, every time there's disease, a virus that's around the area someplace, or a you have to seek a medical director and say, what's my best protection? If he or she is not available, you have to get online and look at the cdc.gov site to see what's the best PPE for this to make sure your supervisors are on board with the CDC recommendations. So, Pathogens, you talk about bacteria in the case of pneumococcal, you talk about viruses in the case of influenza. But there are several talk about this relates directly to you guys now in the field. Is what does your protocol say that you have to have in order to protect yourself in the field? Do you have to have bacterial meningitis vaccine, the so-called uh, meningococcal vaccine, such like that? The answer is probably not. You don't see much of it unless you're on a military base or or you're taking care of an outbreak someplace. But the ones that are essential are the uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and um, uh, hep A, uh, of course, it would be a good one. Not quite mandatory, but very, very advisable. Hepatitis A is a uh, virus that there's no such thing as a carrier state. It's usually pretty self-limiting. The problem is that the only way that you can come in contact with is fecal oral route. So unless there's some real bad hygiene going on someplace with the patients, likelihood of the spread of hepatitis A would be mostly um, from coming in contaminated clothing and, and uh, bedwear and such like that. Uh, so we don't talk too much about hepatitis A. It's a two-shot series. You get the two shots, you call it a day, most people seroconvert. In other words, they become actively immune to hepatitis A. They go you know, stick in your hands in sewer and such like that. But uh, it means that as long as they are not small, the antibodies will attack it. You're going to be as good as gold. Hepatitis B is a different animal. Hepatitis B is pretty nasty. The hepatitis B vaccine is a three shot whatever day you receive it, then one month later you receive the second time of the first dose, you receive your third dose, and then you have to get it tighter about one to two months later. You have to figure out and you've got immunity. If it's less than five, you don't have immunity and you're a non-responder. So you go, don't have it, you're a non-responder. In other words, your immune system didn't respond to it, then you're 
not immune and there's just nothing you're going to do for it and you just have to be counseled that you're not uh, protected from hepatitis B. Now, where do you get hepatitis B? Well, hepatitis B is the classic case where needles, blood-borne, uh, sex, uh, that's, that's the big one. That marries up with HIV 86% of the time. So if HIV can spread that way, hepatitis B can spread that way and vice versa. As a matter of fact, back in 1985, when I was in medical school, this new disease came out, this uh, uh, so-called um, HIV virus, which uh, we called HTLV back then, HTLV3. But as it turned out, we assigned the uh, AIDS uh, disease to that virus. And even though we didn't have a test for HIV, we saw that there's an 86% correlation between HIV and hepatitis B. So back in 1985, as soon as the disease became very prominent and a lot of people were dying of it, the testing that started at the hospitals were actually for hepatitis B. And then if they had the Kaposi sarcoma, the so-called skin cancer is with it, and they kept catching a very peculiar type of uh, pneumonias, pneumocystis pneumonias that were associated with it, we knew that that patient had HIV as well. And remember, there was no real vaccines against hepatitis B at that time. They have since been developed, which is our current state of affairs right now, is that they could be completely protected. Uh, there is uh, no real vaccines against HIV, but we got such strong antivirals now, the reverse transcriptase viruses, um, uh, medications that if caught early can keep your uh, CD4 counts, your so-called white blood cells, high enough to fight infection and yet your viral load, in other words, how many viruses are in your bloodstream in a cubic millimeter, keep that down to zero. And the persons can survive a normal lifespan now being on those retroviral um, ant antibiotics, if you will, the antivirals. Now, it's still not a good idea to catch it. It's still problematic from a lot of different standpoints, but from a uh, physiological standpoint, at least it's not the death sentence that it was 30 years ago when I was in medical school. Now, that's at a time when 100% of the people died and there's just no way around it. The hepatitis B is mandatory vaccination for you guys because hepatitis B can get into the liver and cause hepatocellular carcinomas as well as liver shutdowns and such. People generally with hepatitis B, uh, they are not good candidates for transplants because the hepatitis B virus can hide pretty much everywhere. But again, the biggest, most important precaution that you can take is double PPE, double glove, double mask if they're coughing, congestion, such like that, or if blood is spraying all over the place. But gloves are going to be your biggest, most um, important advantage. And even though this kind of sucks during the summertime, uh, you never know when you're going to run into a real bloody mess someplace with the victim of and then fill in the blank here, whether it's car accident, gunshot, stabbing, uh, machinery accident, farming accident, and such. The next call could very well be one of those calls. And if that patient has HIV or hepatitis B, um, you're going to wish the heck you had proper shirt and pants on. So I'm not a big fan of shorts, and I'm not a huge fan of short sleeve shirts when it comes to the EMS runs. You wear the gloves, you got the long sleeve shirts on. They don't have to be heavy. All they got to do is be light. It's all it's got to do is absorb the blood as it hits it, uh, as long as you're, unless you're soaked in it. But to prevent the so-called splash effect. And then, of course, safety glasses. Um, if you wear natural glasses, it will give you some protection. If you wear safety glasses, it gives you very good protection. But the hepatitis B uh, virus can get in through open wounds, as what happens during blood transfusions. Uh, needle sticks from addicts, methamphetamine, heroin, cocaine, however they're shooting things up these days. Uh, the needles are dirty, they're sharing needles, and everybody's getting HIV or everybody's getting hepatitis B again. And it's, it's becoming quite a plague. Um, of course, many of them don't have a chance to experience the disease because they're using such potent fentanyl dosages that they're actually dying from the overdose itself. And uh, subsequently, there's not going to be much risk of a communicable disease transference at that time. However, if you're resuscitating a patient uh, who's involved in something like that, and you're doing a needle stick IV and given Narcan, uh, there, there's always that chance that you could run into that. And of course, uh, just good personnel practices, 
with um, people that you meet and may want to have a uh, encounter with from a sexual standpoint, um, hepatitis B is still a favorite way to transmit it between people. You don't have to be doing IV drugs to catch hepatitis B if you're with the wrong person. And how do you know the wrong person? You don't. And that's the gamble. So uh, buyer beware. Let's move to hepatitis C now. <clears throat> We've had a great development within the last four years with hepatitis C, which is why we don't really vaccinate against this. Hepatitis C back in the, back in the days of the 80s and 90s was another one that caused a lot of uh, hepatic cancers, but liver cancers, but it also caused immune shutdowns as well. It was a pretty, pretty bad virus to have. And out of the clear blue sky, a laboratory comes out with the medication that combats it to the point where just a 30-day course of this antibiotic, antiviral antibiotic in combination with another antiviral antibiotic uh, cures over 95% of the patients and there's no evidence of hepatitis C anymore. Again, hepatitis C could cause hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the worst of the worst of all the uh, liver cancers. It's equivalent to a small cell carcinoma of the uh, lung, if you will. They carry almost 100% mortality. Now with the cure in place, hepatitis C has become less of a concern for us. It's almost fallen off the map. But yet, hepatitis B and hepatitis C travel in pairs as well. Hepatitis A, it's its own animal, goes through its own ways and such. But B and C can be transmitted in the same ways that we talked about B, from needle sticks to uh, blood transfusions to sex. Um, this hepatitis C is still a concern, although less so now that the cure is in place. But to get to the point where you recognize hepatitis C, uh, you have to have symptoms. And that's the problem with hepatitis B as well. You can have chronic carrier states with hepatitis B and C. And what it means by chronic carrier states is that if you remember typhoid Mary from the uh, 19th century. She carried typhoid fever, yet she was never affected by the disease, but she carried it and she spread it all over the place. Of course, we knew little about transmission of bacterial and viruses back then. And subsequently, nobody really knew it until a whole lot of people around typhoid Mary was getting typhoid. And sooner or later, the scientists of that age finally figured it out and then decided that, hey, this is the first really well-known case of a carrier. In other words, a person who carries it, spreads it around, but yet is not affected by the disease itself. It's a, it's a curious phenomenon. I'm not sure that anybody can explain it. Um, at least to the scientific satisfaction why it happens. Uh, perhaps that immune system is just, just hyper immune against that disease, hard to say. In any event, hepatitis B and C can set up carrier states. Hepatitis B can be carried for a lifetime in an individual who never knows that they have other people, as well as hepatitis C. So hepatitis B being the more malignant of them and hepatitis C having a cure, B. And for the same reasons I mentioned earlier, once you set up where you are protected, once you have greater than 10 on your titers, once you have a solid titers of hepatitis B, you will be immune to it. Hepatitis B virus will be responded to by the immune system will destroy the virus before you become aware of it. You may have a little fatigue, malaise, weakness, cough, cold, congestion-like symptoms, muscle aches, and all of a sudden one day you wake up and say, hey, I'm a whole lot better. And so you go about your merry way through the rest of your life knowing or not knowing that your immune system just saved your life, yet you're thinking it was just a common cold. So that's the way we like things. If you're going to take a vaccine and you're going to get infected by it, you hope that the vaccine works. All right, now we have... Um, so what's the um, what's the other one? Oh, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella. And this is going to be a nice way to wrap this up. I didn't want to make this one too long because I I know that uh, all of you are busy. <clears throat> and um, as I'm going through the national requirements, the 144 hours that you get every four years, uh, two of those hours have to be in immunology, if you will, immunizations. Not only immunizations for the general populace out there, but immunizations for EMS workers. The Journal of Emergency Medical Services had a great article some years back, I think in 2010, that related to immunizations, and it still stands today. 
For those of you who are fire department based, NFPA 1581-1581 uh, outlines the programs that fire departments need to have or EMS agencies if they're prudent and competent and they're following F NFPA standards will have a risk management plan in place, including an aggressive vaccination schedule for each and every one of, uh, of the employees uh, that are there. Now, you should know under law, it is the responsibility of the employer to provide you with the essential vaccines and the follow-up testing. So when you start at a new place, they say we want evidence of your hepatitis titer or evidence that you took the three-shot series and a titer afterwards. And if you don't have that, then they're gonna insist on you get blood tests, but it'll be at their expense. They try to charge you with it, they're in probably in violation of about 43 different laws. And at that point, uh, you wanna get your medical director involved. Um, worse yet, uh, you wanna get some employment lawyer involved with it as, law, as well. But the employers have to provide that for you. So influenza, especially hepatitis B, especially. So for the MMR, we have mumps, measles, and rubella. Now that should be given at 15 months. If any of you have children at home and around the 15 month, you know, you get this triple vaccine, it's the mumps, measles, and rubella. And uh, those are three of the five childhood diseases um, which tend to cause the most mortality. Those vaccines have been around for eons. And even my generation was vaccinated back then in the late 50s, early 60s. With, uh, with MMR. Now there's some controversy out there. For a while it was becoming in the popular press that MMR was related to the development of autism. Back then we didn't know what autism was. So special needs children, such like that, or uh, children who had some sort of attention deficit disorder. Right, that people were getting these diseases and they didn't know what to blame it on. So popular press turned around and said, it's gotta be the MMR vaccine because that gives diseases in one in one million people, it actually gives you the actual disease. The so-called attenuated virus, in other words, the nucleus pulled out of the virus, just like the nucleus is pulled out of bacteria, the pneumococcal bacteria. When the nucleus is out, it's attenuated. In other words, it can stimulate an immune response but it can't give you the disease. That's what the influenza viruses are about. That's what any, most viruses are about, with the exception of rabies or polio, which are killed viruses. But the uh, attenuated viruses, in other words, we've attenuated its ability to give you the disease, attenuated meaning significantly decreasing. So an attenuated virus is gonna be one with its guts pulled out, brains pulled out. So it cannot give you the disease. Although some people are convinced after they get the influenza virus, they get influenza. Uh, be that as it may, it may or may not be. But the vaccination itself is a pretty safe one. MMR has been shown by multiple studies not to be causing autism. And neither is the chicken box vaccine, neither is the herpes zoster vaccine. Chicken pox vaccination is now being recommended. Uh, even though chicken pox is a relatively benign disease, it's the fourth of the five childhood diseases, chicken pox in some cases can cause varicella encephalitis. And the child will look like they're drunk all the time, even though they're five years old or eight years old. They stagger, they can't pick up objects, they can't hold objects in their hands, they're not speaking clearly, they get the cerebellar ataxia that's associated with the chicken pox encephalitis. And of course, chicken pox, when it is successfully defeated by the body, the virus never really goes away. It hides in the dorsal roots of the spinal cord, the sensory side of the nerves coming out of the spinal cord that come around the ribs, anywhere uh, on the body from the face all the way down to the buttocks. And subsequently, in later years, when you get in your 60s, 70s, 80s, the chicken pox virus jumps out, back out again, and causes these very painful rashes that only occur on one side of the body. And that's the herpes zoster. And the zoster virus is uh, what causes shingles. So when a patient comes to you with a very painful rash, and when you look at their midline, that rash comes right up to the midline and it stops, it doesn't cross, that's a shingles virus. And 
we feel that by giving the chicken box, chicken pox vaccination now, killing those viruses, the instance of zoster later in life is going to be significantly decreased. The zoster vaccine has already been uh, developed. And so we give that to older patients who are at risk, but hopefully within the next 30 to 50 years, which is the one to two generational years that we're talking about, we can wipe this out through the use of chicken pox vaccine. Again, those studies show no correlation between the vaccinations and autism. So these vaccinations are considered safe. Are they completely safe? One in a million people are going to get the disease. We get that. We understand that. It's a risk that the U.S. populace has to take. And this goes to your morals and ethics now. You have to ask yourself, do we inoculate a million people, take a chance that one of those persons are going to get the disease, but they're not going to be able to spread it to anybody else, but 999,999 people don't get the disease, and therefore the risk of death or serious illness does not occur. And that's the philosophy behind vaccination. So you have to ask yourself as a parent, yeah, I don't believe in vaccines and I don't want my child to have the vaccination. Well, you have to respect that. Yes, it can. Although you, Rachel, that's a good question, Rachel. Most of the time we think about the uh, chicken pox virus or the Zoster's virus as being in one dermatome. But in patients that I've seen that have had these rashes, they're spread out over two or three dermatomes. You ask yourself the question, is this a person who had a weakened immune response and the virus has spread? Or did the virus suffer more than one dermatome at that time and stay there? We used to think of zoster staying within one dermatome, such as the face or the chest area and such like that. But as you've accurately pointed out, it can exist in a couple of dermatomes, but they're contiguous. It's two, three, and four. It's three and four. It's, it's not one and seven. So you're not going to have it in separate areas. It's just going to be a local spread. So it's going to be consecutive or contiguous dermatomes. So it looks like one big old rash over the, uh, let's say, two or three ribs and the uh, chest wall and such. So yes, it can, it can exist over dermatomes. The problem with the chicken pox vaccine uh, is, from my eyes, chickenpox vaccine can cause problems in one in a million children and such. It causes varicella encephalitis. But to me, that was, that was not worth the cost or the hassle of giving the chickenpox vaccine to everybody for the sake of saving one person. And, and I want you to think I'm cold hearted because I'm not one in one million of those vaccines are going to cause the disease in the person anyway. So this is really a net sum game here. All we're saying is that in this particular event, if you protect the child against chicken pox, then they don't get to be out sick and they don't get to develop other problems. They can go to school with relative impunity and not spread it around to other children and cause an epidemic through the, through the school system, if you would. Well, you know, it depends on where your philosophy uh, uh, sits with that. And I'm just going to leave that to you. As you're all uh, very near to the end of the, your paramedic training and such, and as you get out into the real world, you're going to develop opinions about things and how you should approach different problems, especially in the scientific world, as a lot of this stuff relates to the uh, emergency medical services, because whatever's going on in the hospital is going on in the field. Where do you think the patient's are coming from? the field. So this is going to directly impact you guys as well. But with all of you uh, hopefully having children or already having children, these are questions that are sometimes faced, whether or not to get the vaccinations, not to get the vaccinations. Now, here's one area that I stand very firm on. If you are a healthcare worker, a paramedic, an EMT, or anybody who works in an emergency department in a healthcare field, you will be vaccinated. And that's not negotiable because your safety is what's most important. We can't have you guys get knocked out with these diseases because you're over a period of a 30 year career, a paramedic is gonna run into at least 25,000 patients. The career of an ER physician over 30 years, you're gonna run into about 130,000 patients. There's a good chance, odds are favorite, 
that one of those 130,000 people that you're seeing in an inner city emergency department in one of the major cities in the country has got some badness in their blood. They're going to have hepatitis A, B, and C. They're going to have the whole damn alphabet. They're going to have the chick box. They're going to have MMR. They're going to have HIV. They're going to have some disease that we haven't even heard of yet. And subsequently, you're going to run into these people, whether it's in the rural setting, suburban areas where they're shooting methamphetamine or heroin, or whether it's the inner city where a lot of these uh, diseases had become much more prominent as a result of poor economic, uh, socioeconomic situations such like that. This is where the money's at. This is where the diseases are at. And this is why you need to be vaccinated. Okay, let me see if I've covered the last of them. HIV, we talked about a little bit. Um, SARS, multi-resistant organism, West Nile virus. Uh, an acquaintance of ours, a hospital administrator was uh, bitten by a mosquito here recently. And uh, three weeks later, he came into the emergency spot with a real nonspecific rash but he had 105 temperature and uh, he had headache, confusion, he had some uh, uh, muscle weakness as well. And we thought at first this might've been Guillain-Barre. This might've been one of those weirdo viruses that causes an ascending paralysis from the legs all the way up to the arms. Lasts about three weeks. You sit on a ventilator for three weeks, wait for the virus to go away. And then you're back to normal again. Well, he came in, as it turned out, as we did more testing and such, he ended up with wet snile. He's had permanent loss of his uh, movement of his legs. He won't stand again or walk again. He developed what they call transverse myelitis and inflammation of the spinal cord, uh, which um, is permanent in his case. Uh, so the inflammation is almost like just cutting the cord in half. It's not letting any nerve impulses pass it. And if it doesn't let any nerve impulses pass it, you're not gonna get any movement in your legs and such. So it's become quite a problematic uh, disease, especially in the uh, areas that have a lot of coastal waters and such. What we're expecting a breakout is down in Houston and maybe even Mississippi now, uh, where the hurricanes have hit and there's standing water, there's brackish ponds, there's these areas where mosquitoes can fester and such. And all the, one of those has to be is a West Nile virus and you get stung by it or about bitten by the mosquito that carries it and you've got West Nile. Most people that get the West Nile virus will fight it off, no problems. Or they may come in the emergency room cough, cold, congestion, headache, and they look like any other virus in the world. And so we do the usual thing. We give them antibiotics, which do absolutely nothing, but at least, you know, you feel like something's being done for you, even though nothing's being done for you. And so it's just a matter of cough, cold, and congestion, Tylenol, Motrin, and hot baths, hot fluids, chicken broth soup, and rest and relax. The problem with West Nile is that it starts out that way. You know, it looks like the common cold. It is until you wake up and like this guy did, he woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And as he got up, he fell right to the ground. So he tried to stand up again. He couldn't pull. He couldn't stand up. He could pull himself up, but he lost function of his legs. And it happened at two o'clock in the morning. When he went to bed at 10 o'clock that night, he walked into bed. And by 2 a.m., paralyzed from the waist down. West Nile is relentless. It takes three weeks to incubate. So after the mosquito sting, you're feeling that cough, cold, congestion, or fatigue and weakness, but no big deal. It's, it's like every other day we wake up in the morning to go to work. I really don't want to go. I feel fatigue, lace and fatigue. But he came in, by the time he came to us, he had 105 temperature and uh, he was paralyzed from the waist down. So we had an inkling and a suspicion to us now. Now, here's the big question. And we're going to wrap this up with this one. How do you vaccinate against West Nile? How do you prevent West Nile? Anybody got any reasons? Anybody got any suggestions? Do we have a vaccine? No. Are we working on one? Yes. Is it working? No. But we're trying. And everybody's still working. DEET. Haha, <laughs> very good. Anybody else? Anybody here military? You'll find permethrin, DEET, uh, to be the, um, there you go. Uh, I thought I recognized a, a military person. The, um, when you take your clothes and you soak it in the DEET and then you thoroughly soak them and then you lay them out in the sun and you let them dry off, you put the clothes back on and it feels like you're putting on 
a cotton blanket. It's just beautiful to put on. It doesn't make your clothing sticky, starchy, scratchy, wool feeling, none of that. That deep just blends right in with the cotton and you can put on your uniform and you're completely protected. Mosquitoes start coming around within six inches to a foot of you, smell it, and they head south. They go to the next guy or girl. And that's the beauty of DEET or permethrin. So what we do in the military is we take our uniforms and we soak them there, especially when we were doing campaigns in the Philippines back in 2001, 2002, after the bad guys hit us on September 11. A lot of us went to Mindanao or Zamboanga province, and we were in the jungles there. You put the DEET on, and you can see these mosquitoes flying all over the place. They're big enough to pick up small children and such. And yet when they come within about a foot of you, they, they ran away. They just flew away. And it's the same thing here. Now you see programs, you see tankers going along the sides of roads just spraying water. And unless they're doing some sort of landscaping project, which most aren't, they're spraying all the brackish ponds, all the standing water and such like that. They're spraying it with these toxins that will kill the larvae of the mosquitoes and the mosquitoes themselves. And the only way that we're gonna eradicate West Nile until a vaccine is developed is to eradicate the mosquitoes and, and what they're carrying. Now, seeing that there's about oh, 80,000 mosquitoes, actual statistic, not BSing it, 80,000 mosquitoes within any square acre of land in humid areas, the chances of us eradicating all of it are just about zero, but we have to try because West Nile does hang out in some particular places. And if it's endemic in one place, in other words, if it's spreading all over the place, these are the places that you have to spray. So when those poor guys get out there with their mosquito stuff and they're spraying all over the place, just understand that they're probably going after West Nile more than anything else. All right. That's about it for your briefing. I'll give you credit for one hour on this, even though we came up a little short. Um, this would be the one hour briefing that you have on your immunizations and immunological responses, why we do what we do, and some of the nasty bugs that are out there that we're trying to protect ourselves from. Uh, does anybody have any questions before we call it a night? Elizabeth says no. Jim, Stephen, no. Michelle, no, very good. Stephen, no. Anybody else? Got two more responses coming. All right. Well, if there's nothing further, I want you all to have a good night, and we're um, we're going to call it a night, and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next round table. Thank you, Dr. Frame. Everybody, I got you. So have a good holiday tomorrow. Don't forget it's Columbus Day. Good night. All right, Jane, have a good night. We'll talk to you tomorrow. All righty. Bye-bye.